Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, Stimulant Loose Disorder, uh, Part 1, Strategies to Address Cocaine and Methamphetamine. Our presenter today is Rick Rawson, PhD, and this webinar is being hosted by the Great Lakes ATTC and the Northwest ATTC. The Great Lakes ATTC and the Northwest ATTC are two regional centers, one of, uh, or each part of a network of 10 regional centers across the U.S. We've been funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for the past 25 years. And this year is our 25-year anniversary. The Great Lakes ATTC serves the states in HHS Region 5, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And the Northwest ATTC serves the states of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. A couple of housekeeping items for you all to know before we begin. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing from the Northwest and the Great Lakes ATTC website along with PowerPoint slides from Dr. Rossen's presentation. And here you see on the, the screen our website addresses where you can check for those both of those items within the next week or so. We're not offering CEUs for this webinar. The audio is being broadcast through your computer speakers, so you'll want to make sure that they're turned on and up. There's no phone number for you to dial in for this webinar. We'll be taking questions after the presentation, and you can post them in the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. So please uh, feel free to ask your questions. And our presenter today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Rick Rossen. He's an emeritus professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Science at the UCLA School of Medicine. He's also a research professor at the University of Vermont. He received a PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Vermont in 1974. Dr. Rossen has conducted an extensive portfolio of research on cocaine and methamphetamine including projects on behavioral and medication treatment with brain imaging measures. He was a member of the Federal Methamphetamine Advisory Group for Attorney General Janet Reno. During the past decade, he's worked with NIDA, SAMHSA, the U.S. State Department, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime on international substance abuse research and training projects exporting U.S. technology and addiction science throughout the world. Dr. Rawson has published three books, 40 book chapters, and more than 240 professional papers, and annually conducts numerous workshops, paper presentations, paper presentations, and training sessions. Thanks very much for being our presenter today, Dr. Rawson. Would you like to take it away? Okay, thank you very much. Um, in case anybody wonders, I'm in Vermont right now. Um, <clears throat> I was at UCLA for 40 years and uh, moved back home to Vermont where I'm from. And uh, since I've been here, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, opioids with the Vermont Hub and Spoke system. And as we've been uh, working on that, we've started to see a lot of cocaine and some methamphetamine here in Vermont, but we're now seeing a good quarter of the patients we have on uh, buprenorphine and methadone currently using uh, cocaine. So the uh, issue of uh, cocaine and methamphetamine is one that uh, I've been involved with now for a long time. And uh, unfortunately, we seem to be having a cycle where cocaine and methamphetamine are uh, increasing again. Uh, I've got no conflicts of interest. Um, let me talk a little bit about the epidemiology. Uh, 
cocaine, of course, is primarily uh, grown and uh, coca is grown in South America, manufactured in, uh, in, and converted into cocaine in laboratories, both in South America and Central America, and shipped uh, to mostly North America and Europe are the two major markets. It's estimated there's about 20 million or so uh, cocaine users worldwide, including uh, crack users, uh, which is smokable cocaine. Uh, with amphetamine type stimulants, we have uh, about three times as many, two to three times as many people worldwide that use uh, what we refer to as ATS, amphetamine type stimulants, which includes methamphetamine and amphetamine, with methamphetamine being the primary one here in the United States. We see some pharmaceutical amphetamine. Actually, here in Vermont, some of the doctors in primary care were talking about a lot of their patients having pharmaceutical, uh, uh, having prescriptions for stimulants that they thought were um, inappropriate. And so there is some evidence of uh, uh, medication, stimulant medications used for ADHD and other uh, purposes starting to show up on the street and be uh, misused. But by far the biggest stimulant in the United States that's used is methamphetamine. It used to be manufactured in the U.S. and is still to some degree manufactured in the U.S., but the majority of methamphetamine comes across the border and is, um, uh, comes in from the big labs in Mexico. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the methamphetamine that's being used now is, is, is made with a different formula than was back in the 90s and early 2000s. It's much more potent and it's much more lethal. Um, as you'll see, one of the um, uh, rather unfortunate uh, things we're seeing with cocaine and methamphetamine is an increase in deaths related to them. This slide gives you some information on cocaine-related deaths from 2003 to 2017. And as you can see, the hockey stick um, curve that with the very sharp increase starting in about 2013, 2014, uh, is uh, very dramatic, and it's um, now it's a bit misleading in that most of these deaths occur with fentanyl uh, mixed together with cocaine. A lot of the cocaine now in the United States is sold with fentanyl included. The users, m many of them, don't know that they're getting fentanyl, which is one of the reasons for the fatalities. Uh, they take cocaine as they normally would, thinking they're getting cocaine, uh, and they do get some cocaine, but they also get fentanyl, and there are, many of them are opioid, uh, uh, they're not tolerant to opioids, they're opioid naive, and so their uh, risk for overdose death is very high from the current cocaine on the street. Here in Vermont, about 50% of the samples of cocaine uh, include fentanyl. Similar thing is happening with uh, amphetamine-type stimulants, methamphetamine in the U.S. Uh, you see the um, very sharp increase in, in deaths. Here it's related, much of it's related to uh, fentanyl inclusion, but you can also see from this that stimulants without any opioids in, involved them also are showing a sharp increase. And this, resent, this represents the... Uh, increased potency of methamphetamine. So a lot of the meth users, those of you in parts of the country that have seen uh, methamphetamine used for a long time, one of the things you're more likely to see now in this current uh, 2019 environment is much higher rates of psychosis and much higher rates of uh, deaths. The deaths generally occur from cardiovascular uh, in, in uh, insults, cardiovascular problems, or strokes. So strokes and heart attacks are the main reason. People generally don't die from uh, methamphetamine from respiratory depression like they do from opioids, but because there's also fentanyl, you're never sure exactly what you're dealing with. So the, the cocaine and methamphetamine uh, situations in the U.S. are showing an increase, and they're showing much greater lethality than they ever have before. Uh, there's, uh, this is an article by uh, a group out of St. Louis or the St. Louis area. And the point here is simply that chronic opioid users, the people that we've been building treatment for for op the opioid crisis, are now uh, showing increased use of, uh, 
of opioids. There's a couple of papers on this. This one's on methamphetamine. This goes from 2011 to 2017 over that six-year period. There was about a doubling in the rate of uh, opioid users who are also using methamphetamine. Uh, generally, what we see is in more rural areas, uh, the opioid, uh, we're seeing more meth use. In the urban areas, we tend to see more cocaine use, more meth in the west, more cocaine in the east. Uh, but there's plenty of exceptions to that. For example, West Virginia has a, a very big methamphetamine problem, which uh, has really uh, blossomed in the last 10 years, which uh, is unfortunate to go along with their very severe opioid problem. Uh, a little bit about the neurobiology. I'm not going to go through a big uh, 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 lecture on this, but uh, just uh, for a couple of things that are important to know. First off, uh, cocaine has a much shorter half-life than methamphetamine. Cocaine, the cocaine high, which really relates to the time that the drug is in the bloodstream and is active is about 20 to 30 minutes. So the half-life is about, about the high life is about an hour. The half-life is about an hour or so, hour to two hours. With methamphetamine, it's much longer. The high can last you know, uh, 12 hours or so. The half-life is 12 hours. Um, and you also see a lot more neurotoxicity with methamphetamine. Methamphetamine really damages the brain to a greater extent than cocaine does. Now, cocaine certainly has produces dramatic changes in the brain chemistry and is um, a, a very powerful chemical. But methamphetamine, be, partly because of its longer half-life, uh, has more uh, produces more damage that more, that takes longer for the brain to recover from. Just uh, a real. Uh, simplistic uh, pictures. If you look at the cocaine neurobiology, cocaine has a very simple effect on the on the brain. In the reward center of the brain and other parts, but the one we're most interested in is the reward center. Uh, the cocaine's effect is to block the reuptake of dopamine. That is, dopamine is released by a neuron and it communicates with the next neuron. And when cocaine is in the system, Cocaine stops the dopamine from being reabsorbed by the first neuron. That means it stays in the snaps and it causes the downstream neuron to keep firing. So the way cocaine has its effect is very simple. It, when you take cocaine, you get a lot more dopamine remaining in the, in the synapse between neurons, causing the neurons to keep firing. And if it's in the reward center of the brain, that uh, results in pleasure. Methamphetamine does the same thing, and methamphetamine goes into the upstream neuron and causes a release of dopamine in the, um, the terminal of the neuron. Now, that produces more dopamine release, and it also destroys the upstream neuron. It also destroys functions of the upstream neuron. So with cocaine, you get this sort of temporary effect that uh, – generally uh, relates to the, the, the uh, dopamine uptake rate. With methamphetamine, you actually get a greater effect and more uh, damage to the neurons. So with a lot of the methamphetamine users you'll see will have more cognitive damage and their recovery process will take longer. They'll, it, it'll take them longer to start to function uh, normally. Just a quick overview of some of the clinical challenges of working with Patients with stimulant use disorders, if you've mainly worked with opioid users, because in the last 10 years we've been flooded with the opioid crisis in many parts of the country, so many of us have been seeing people with heroin and prescription opioid problems. But with um, uh, stimulant users, you have a different clinical syndrome. With opioid users, their major focus is on not getting sick. Once we get addicted, they're they're, the whole focus of treatment uh, is around them not getting sick and, and helping to prevent withdrawal and controlling the anxiety of going into withdrawal. With stimulants, it's different. With stimulants, um, the withdrawal syndrome is relatively not a big deal. I mean, it's significant in that people don't feel great, but it doesn't become the focus of their um, addiction. With stimulant users, you have the issue that many of them don't think they're addicted or don't understand they're addicted. 
Opioid users, on the other hand, do understand they're addicted. They, they know when they wake up and they're sick that they're, they have the, the disease of addiction. Stimulant users, they can stop and start and uh, not really are not that obsessed with the issue of withdrawal. Uh, partly because of that, they're very ambivalent about whether they need to stop or not. I interviewed 25 patients here in Vermont who were taking cocaine and were on a methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, only two of them expressed any interest in stopping. The other 23 were said, well, I, I need to do something about it because my doctor is upset and is threatening to uh, throw me out of treatment. But I don't really see what the problem is. And so there's a lot of ambivalence. And so one tool that's, that's essential in working with stimulant users is motivational interviewing. We'll get around to talking about that uh, in, in a bit. But uh, this ambivalence is a real hallmark of stimulant, uh, working with patients with stimulant use disorders. They're impulsive as the brain is affected by their stimulant use and, and their judgment is impaired. Uh, they have very poor memory. So if you're doing cognitive behavioral treatment or psychoeducation with them, you have to do it very simply. You have to repeat it. You have to make sure that uh, they, they get uh, multiple chances to learn it because uh, in the early months of treatment, particularly with meth users, they don't remember much of anything that they are, are presented in treatment. Uh, the hallmark, the single hallmark of methamphetamine or of stimulant dependence is anhedonia. That's this inability to experience pleasure. And you'll hear this from stimulant users in the early weeks and months of recovery where they'll say, if this is how it's going to feel to be sober, I can't live my life like this because nothing feels good. What you have is a, a reward system that's been down-regulated, uh, particularly with methamphetamine. And so they're, they're, the thing that it takes to make them feel good is, is it takes a much bigger bang than uh, they generally receive from day-to-day -day activities. So a lot of them are walking around with this sort of gray, life doesn't have anything interesting, life doesn't have anything enjoyable, and that can put somebody in a very precipitous uh, position regarding relapse. Also, something that's a central issue with uh, stimulant-dependent uh, individuals is people is this Pavlovian trigger craving response. And although it happens with alcohol and cannabis and opioids, with stimulants, it's much more powerful and it's much more unstable in that People will be cruising along, doing relatively well in their recovery, and all of a sudden will go off, off the uh, track, and they won't really be able to understand what happened to them. In many cases, they got triggered. Somebody gave them some money. They saw an old drug-using friend. They used some alcohol. They have some of the triggers that are associated with their use through Pavlovian conditioning, and it produces this overwhelming craving. And if they've been injectors or smokers of drug, the drugs, that it's a very, very volatile response. And it's not a rational response. It's not something you can think through. It just is a very powerful physical reaction where you're going along doing fine, and all of a sudden you can't think of anything except using. And that, that's a really powerful uh, response. Um, obviously, the majority of treatment for stimulant use disorders is done on an outpatient basis, and these patients are very difficult to retain in treatment. And tr retention is the ball game. Um, if you can't retain them in treatment, nothing's they're they're, they're not going to uh, produce positive change. Uh, the the basic principle of treatment with stimulant patients with stimulant use disorders is if you can keep them in treatment you have a good chance that they're going to make good progress. If you can't keep them in treatment, they won't. So retention isn't some kind of sort of annoying byproduct that you're uh, working on. Some people get to think, oh, we have this great program, and, and damn it, we just can't get them to do it. The issue isn't what your program is. The issue is that you focus on retention. If you can keep them coming in, it works. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard that before, but with stimulant, patients with stimulant use disorders, retaining them in the process is really 90% of the challenge. And so when I get to talking about treatment, we're going to talk about treatments that in, increase retention. 
Uh, and finally, you do see patients with a fairly elevated rates of uh, psychiatric comorbidity, including uh, psychotic disorders, but more typically uh, affective disorders, high levels of anxiety and high levels of depression. These are some of the population groups that require special attention. Uh, the first two groups, if you look at the treatment outcome data with stimulant use disorder patients, uh, injectors and people who use daily or almost daily are different than uh, the other people who are more episodic users or who use intranasally. Um, and we've seen this in a whole variety of research over the years. Injectors have a more profound um, dependence and the, the heavier users, um, they almost develop a withdrawal like an opioid withdrawal, but the, the, the triggering is much worse, the anhedonia is much worse, the relapse rates are much worse. And for many of those patients who are injectors or daily users, they really need to be started in a higher level of care. Uh, they really just don't have a chance to uh, stop their stimulant use on an outpatient basis. Their, their brain is too disordered. Generally, chronic uh, homeless and chronically mentally ill patients re require additional attention. A uh, population group that's been particularly impacted by uh, methamphetamine, specifically our men who have sex with men, uh, with that population, their stimulant use gets all interconnected with their sexual behavior, putting them at high risk for HIV transmission and um, other infectious disease transmission. So this is a group where there's been a lot of work done uh, around the issue of how to prevent HIV transmission because when they use methamphetamine, uh, their uh, high-risk sexual behavior goes way up and stimulant craving becomes sexual arousal and vice versa. And so they, the two things become very interconnected and the user has a very difficult uh, time managing uh, either. Uh, younger users certainly are, um, require some additional uh, strategies in People on medication treatment for opioid use disorder are a group that are going to be increasingly uh, impacted by this uh, increase in stimulant use. Um, one, this is just a very quick point. The data that I'm going to talk about on behavioral treatments comes from research with cocaine users and research with methamphetamine users. However, you should, for all practical purposes, uh, consider with the use of behavioral treatments that um, what works with meth users will work with cocaine users. What works with cocaine users, for the most part, will work with meth users. You don't have to develop one track that's for cocaine users and a different track for meth users. They're, they're stimulant, they have patients with stimulant use disorders. And we've done some research on a variety of trials uh, and which show that you get very comparable response with behavioral treatments. These were uh, uh, studies where um, Cocaine users and meth users were being treated in the same facility at the same time by the same staff with the same protocol, and, and we're get, we got identical results. So if you're doing work and you've got a treatment that you have that seems to work well for your cocaine users, uh, you'll find uh, it, it has a good chance of working well for the meth users. All right, well, let's talk about the different uh, treatments we have uh, for patients with stimulant dependence. There has recently, in the last six months, been a meta-analysis published by the group at Oxford in the UK looking at um, the comparative effective efficacy and acceptability of psychosocial interventions for individuals with cocaine and amphetamine addiction. It's a very timely paper. It's a very well-done paper. These are the people who did this study are not addiction experts. They are meta-analysis experts. They are experts in how to analyze big sets of studies, multiple studies on a topic, and they've chosen as the topic cocaine and methamphetamine dependence, and they just published this uh, at the end of uh, last year. Their meta-analysis, they, they had 50 studies they looked at with about 10,000 participants, 12 interventions for cocaine and amphetamine addiction. And what they found and what they concluded was the combination of two different psychosocial interventions, namely contingency management and the community reinforcement approach was the most efficacious and most acceptable treatment both in the 
short and long term. Similarly, in what is called the Crimson analysis, which is a, it's a worldwide group that does meta-analyses of areas of medicine, this, they did, uh, recently, well, this is a, was done a few years ago, now, almost 10 years ago. They looked at psychosocial interventions for stimulant, uh, psychostimulant amphetamine-related disorders. This group uh, had 27 studies, and the underlined is their conclusion. Some form of contingency management in, uh, was effective in respect to both reducing dropouts and lower, lowering cocaine use. There had been two other meta-analyses um, and uh, both of them, uh, so a total of four meta-analyses on stimulant, treatment of stimulant use disorders, all come to the same conclusion, and that is that contingency management and community reinforcement approach, where it was used and where it was added to the, to the, the study, uh, have very strong, robust evidence of efficacy. Everything else is in second place. Now, that may be a surprise to you, uh, but uh, the data are, are extremely uh, robust with this. I did a lot of talking about uh, opioid medications over my career. I would go out and do talks on methadone and buprenorphine and naltrexone. And for many years, uh, people sort of rolled their eyes and said, OK, OK, we hear, you, we hear the data, but we don't believe in medicines. You know, we don't really think medicines are the way to go. And uh, that's changed in the last. 10 years with the opioid epidemic, we're seeing a much greater acceptance of medications for opioid use disorder. I have a similar feeling with regard to the use of contingency management for stimulant use disorders. Though, and, and like I used to hear with medications, people will say, oh yeah, okay, we see all that research that says it works, but we don't believe in that. We don't, we don't think that's really the right kind of treatment. All I can say is the data are overwhelming on this. NIDA has uh, published on this. Uh, SAMHSA has put together packages of treatment materials. The, um, uh, the data are really overwhelming. So let me talk a little bit about what contingency management is. Uh, I, most of you may know and be familiar with it. It's also called motivational incentives. Um, and there's been research on it for a long time. It's a technique that em employs the systematic delivery of positive reinforcement for desired behaviors. In the case of stimulants, vouchers or prizes can be used or earned for drug-free urine samples as one example of a, of a behavior that you want to see increased. You want to get drug-free urine samples and keep people in treatment, then uh, providing incentives can be useful uh, in that area. The principle comes right out of 1933 B.F. Skinner, uh, uh, his book on positive reinforcement, the whole idea of positive reinforcement that if you want a behavior to increase in frequency, if you reward the behavior, you're more likely to see an increase in frequency. And so if the behavior you want to increase is people giving drug-free urines or stimulant-free urines, if you reward them, you'll get more of them. It's that simple. It's not a complicated concept at all. People use incentives in all kinds of ways. I mean, we give our kids incentives for getting good grades. People get bonuses for good performance in their work. The whole idea of use of positive reinforcing incentives is very common and very is a central sort of mechanism in, in uh, behavior. Uh, that simple, this contingency management simply is applying that principle to uh, reducing stimulant use disorders. The basic principles are you have, a, you have to have a behavior you can monitor and measure uh, objectively. What somebody tells you, but in, in the case of drug use, you need something like a saliva test or a urine test that uh, will give you an objective measure of that behavior. Or if you're going to get reward people for attending treatment sessions, you can do that. And if they attend, they get this, uh, the incentive. If they don't, they don't. Um, so the center, you get the incentive when the target behavior occurs, and you remove the incentive when the target behavior doesn't occur. So if they commit, they don't commit, they don't obviously get the incentive. Or if they give a positive urine sample. Um, there have been a bunch of studies. John Roll from uh, uh, Spokane has, has done a lot of work with contingency management. He wrote a big study for NIDA. 
that uh, was uh, done uh, around the turn of the century um, and got very, this is just a sample of some of the data. This is retention rate, uh, the orange line being patients who are uh, given incentives. And you can see but this is the percentage of negative samples over time so that across the whole 12 weeks of the trial, a much higher rate, almost double as many um, uh, patients gave uh, negative urine samples as in the treatment as usual. The treatment as usual actually was a, uh, a CBT approach that was um, uh, well, well, res well respected. It simply, when you added the incentives to it, you got a much bigger bang from the treatment. We did a study and published in 2004 comparing CBT with uh, contingency management. We had three groups over uh, 16 weeks. One group got three CBT groups a week. One group got uh, three contingency management groups, three contingency management sessions. That is, they'd come in and give urine samples and would uh, get, either get an incentive or not. They didn't get any counseling at all. And then there was a third group that got both. They got CBT and contingency management. And this went over 16 weeks. And just one quick uh, uh, illustration of the results. This is the uh, number of drug-free urine samples we got from the patients in those three conditions. CBT, we got about 15, uh, and we got twice as, almost twice as many in the other two groups that had contingency management. Uh, and when you added CBT to contingency management, it did not significantly improve the outcome. That is, the outcome, the, the, the effective uh, uh, intervention here was the contingency management. Similarly, we did another study, very similar design, uh, with patients on who were on methadone maintenance and were using cocaine. And we had four groups this time. We had CPT, we had contingency management, we had both, and we had neither. We had, so we had a, a control group that just got their basic methadone treatment. Uh, similar uh, results. We found that uh, the group that only got methadone maintenance, we got 11 drug-free samples over 16 weeks out of a potential 48. Um, with CBT, we got uh, an increase, but the biggest increases came with the two groups that got contingency management. And, and I could show you another 15 studies on this topic with contingency management. It's been uh, done to death in terms of showing that it works. Our problem is we can't get people to use it. Um, and, a lot, and we can talk about in a bit why that is. I mean, it's, a, um, it's not a traditional thing. Similar to the, the way a lot of treatment programs 10 years ago would say, well, you know, we can't really use medicine. Our program really isn't set up to do medicine. Uh, we don't have a doctor. We don't, you know, prescribe in our program. We just do behavioral treatment. I think that we're in a similar situation with contingency management where we have to figure out how to use it in our, in our system because it has by far the best outcome. Community reinforcement is, is a, a treatment that you may have heard. It's a, a, a counseling type approach that involves helping people arrange their lives in such a way that they start to receive positive reinforcement from the world. Um, in, it has a variety of components, behavioral skills, counseling, um, and you can see the list. Uh, and with most of the trials, they use a voucher-based uh, reinforcement system, actual contingency management together with community reinforcement. Uh, my colleague at the University of Vermont, Steve Higgins, published what was really a landmark study in the early 90s using uh, community reinforcement together with vouchers uh, and got uh, really uh, outstanding results. This gives you some idea of the um, standard treatment, which was a basic 12-step counseling approach versus uh, people who are given community reinforcement and contingency management. This is the uh, proportion of people giving on the first bars. It's uh, first people who completed treatment. This was a 16-week trial. Uh, the second bar is those who got eight weeks of consecutive uh, continuous abstinence, and the third set of bars are those who got uh, the full 16 weeks of continuous abstinence. Uh, th these, these uh, in contingency management studies, we don't give people cash. We never give them cash because for many people it's a trigger. 
we have to find ways we can use vouchers. Uh, some people have like a little store in their office where they people can get movie tickets or restaurant tickets or car, gas cards or other um, things of value, but not cash itself, since cash can often be a trigger. Uh, you know, certainly people can sell the things and get uh, a cash, but it does seem to be a big deterrent in triggering their use. Um, LIDA has a manual. SAMHSA has a manual on the use of community reinforcement and contingency management, and they're uh, uh, widely available. The Veterans Administration has made extensive use of contingency management, and it's it's a major it's the major approach for treating stimulant use disorders within the VA system now. So it's um, it can be done. It's just a matter of people really uh, thinking through how to get the resources to do the the uh, contingency management and how to uh, set it up in your uh, treatment system. CBT, and, and many of you are familiar with CBT. CBT has a long history of uh, 30 years or so of, of work. Kathleen Carroll from Yale has been the main uh, researcher who's done a tremendous amount of work on this topic. And there have been multiple studies showing CBT to work, although in the meta-analyses, um, Although they mention and they note that CBT has effectiveness, uh, they often note, uh, as I pointed out, in studies where contingency management is done alongside CBT, you tend to get a bigger effect with contingency management. But certainly CBT would be considered an evidence-based practice. Now, there are some other strategies. I was involved in the development of something starting in the mid, early and mid-80s uh, that we call the matrix model, which is a big manual that seems to publish. Um, we really only ever did one large trial with a thousand patients. Uh, and so the, the data to support it is uh, less than these other approaches. But uh, it's a 16-week program, generally three times a week. It includes these components. Uh, you can still get the manual on the SAMHSA website. If you go to the SAMHSA store and put in matrix manual, you can still get this at, at no cost. And, and there's still a lot of use of it, I think, uh, for uh, uh, many people, particularly in the area of methamphetamine dependence. I'm recommending that if people want to really get the best outcomes, however, if they're going to use the matrix approach, they supplement it with contingency management because I think the um, the data are just very strong that you'll get a much more robust response. You'll get better attention. You'll get more drug-free samples. And, and these pa patients will be in treatment longer. Um, the matrix approach, you know, if you look at these data, we, it was an eight-site, multi-site trial with 1,000 patients. And all, in seven of the eight sites, we got superior um, uh, number of group-free urines over the, at the trial uh, with matrix and with a, a control condition, counseling treatment as usual, uh, except in one, Hayward, California, where it was in a drug court. And within the drug court, it didn't seem to matter so much what you did uh, because of the contingencies of the drug court were very powerful. Um, here's some other things, motivational interviewing. Um, it doesn't have any direct evidence of um, in, in its application with uh, stimulant use disorder, but there's a lot of, not with meth anyway, I think there is some, there are some studies with cocaine. Um, but it, clearly, it, is, it needs to be an essential part of how you work with stimulant users because of the ambivalence issue. Um, motivational interviewing skills are really important. Uh, before I left UCLA, we published um, a, a large-scale study on the, on the effects of exercise. If I was going to continue my research career in the area of stimulant dependence of treatment, this is where I would be spending time is in the area of uh, physical exercise. We got some pretty big effects, uh, and we published seven or eight papers out of this data set. We found much lower relapse rates after people were discharged from a residential center based on whether they had had exercise or not had exercise as part of the uh, their residential uh, treatment uh, time. And we got brain changes. We found that those who had exercise you saw a recovery of the D2 uh, dopamine system, uh, more profound recovery, also lower depression, more anxiety uh, in, in 
very large uh, measures for people who are exercising. So I think exercise is not just a good thing to do because it makes you healthy. I think it's specifically an effective intervention for uh, providing assistance. In, in my clinical experience of working with patients, um, it seems to be the only thing that really helps with the anhedonia. Uh, the people who exercise appear to start to feel better uh, more rapidly. Of course, the trick is how do you get them to exercise? Um, uh, many of our stimulant-using patients are not exactly health nuts, and so the um, getting them to exercise is an issue. Now, that may be where contingency management could be woven together with exercise and other things, but it's, uh, exercise is, is a real intervention. It's not some kind of placebo. It's a good thing. Uh, there have been some, there's a couple of studies done with mindfulness um, that have some modest uh, evidence of uh, support, um, but I think that that needs a lot more research to consider it um, um, a, an evidence-based uh, intervention. There are some medications that have been researched. Uh, the first study I was ever involved with was in 1981, um, and we looked at imipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, and since that time, there have been dozens of studies on medication. The medications that appear promising for cocaine patients with cocaine use disorders include this list, topiramate, is probably the leading candidate, although um, modafinil and bupropion uh, or Welbutrin uh, do seem to have some uh, benefits. And so I think the um, uh, none of these, though, has yet been approved by the FDA for the treatment of cocaine dependence. Uh, similarly, um, patients with methamphetamine use disorder include these. Uh, bupro bupropion or Welbutrin does have several studies showing it to be uh, uh, effective, particularly with lower severity users. With those with very severe use, it doesn't seem to be particularly effective. Um, mirtazapine is an antidepressant. There's now been a new trial since I made up these slides um, showing its effectiveness. So there have now been two very powerful, well-done studies on mirtazapine, so I do think um, we're, we're honing in on some medications that may be useful. But at the present time, behavioral treatment is the sole evidence-based uh, intervention for uh, treatment of stimulant use disorders. Um, I mentioned this issue of uh, patients who are uh, using stimulants who are on uh, opioid uh, medications. As I said, I did this interview with uh, uh, 25 patients here in Vermont. Um, in the Vermont clinics, it's about somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent who are using cocaine. I did a talk in San Diego uh, about six months ago. There they cited 60 percent of their buprenorphine patients were using methamphetamine. And so I, and we're seeing increased rates. So as we go about addressing the opioid epidemic with buprenorphine and methadone and naltrexone to save lives from the opioid epidemic, one of the issues we're going to have to deal with in parallel is their stimulant use because those medications, buprenorphine and methadone, do not um, affect their, um, their use of, of stimulants. And in fact, in some ways, uh, patients will talk about how they're able to use stimulants while on those medications, and the, the, the after effects, the negative consequential effects of the stimulant use is less severe if they're on these opioid medications. So this is a real high vulnerability group, and we saw this happen in the 90s when uh, clinics that were providing methadone treatment really were devastated with the cocaine epidemic, and many patients who had done well for years on methadone were destabilized. And um, so this is, this is going to be uh, an important issue that we're able to treat this population. I interviewed these 25 patients to get some sense of what they thought about their stimulant use, how they thought about it, and what their um, um, perception of it was. One thing they were, 25 out of 25 said, uh, 
making me go to more counseling is not going to reduce my stimulant use. Uh, it's, I'm not going to be counseled out of it. Uh, they're, uh, they were universally clear about that. And I've always been somebody who has sort of tried to find out what patients think about treatment, because if you can deliver patient-centered treatment, tr treatment that addresses the patient's needs and perceptions, you generally get a better uptake of, of the treatment uh, materials. Uh, so the, the sort of generic counseling, uh, tell me about your problems and how can you stop your cocaine use, isn't likely to do much. Uh, there were some, um, this is what they said about their stimulant use. First off, they said they didn't think it was a problem, um, that the craving response was um, really powerful. Many of them in, in, in both San Diego and, and Los Angeles, or in uh, Vermont, said that the stimulants were very available now and very cheap, and they could get them anywhere, and that the craving uh, would be triggered by lots of things. And for, interestingly, for a lot of these folks who are uh, coming to clinics to get their methadone or buprenorphine, coming to the clinic itself was a um, um, trigger. So coming and being around other, other users, certainly those who are dealing uh, um, drugs and there are always some of those around. But um, so the, the clinic environment is an important issue to consider at, with this population. Um, and the other sort of things that were triggers are sort of the standard things we see. Um, there were four of them in all who said they had done things in the past that had worked. And I didn't, I didn't give them a list and say, tell me what's worked for you. I just said, have you ever had any success in stopping your stimulant use in, in your history? Four of them said yes. Two had been in contingency management studies in a contingency management clinic that the University of Vermont had run uh, 10 years ago, no longer is, is operating, uh, but is getting, it's going back into business. But, uh, and two had done well in the drug court. Well, drug courts really are large-scale contingency management um, operations. You, if you give drug-free urines, good, thing happen, good things happen. If you don't, bad things can happen. And so those are contingencies. And so the uh, four patients who uh, said they had actually been able to um, uh, decrease or stop their stimulant use, all four had found some kind of contingency-ish program to be uh, useful, thereby sort of reinforcing the message out of the literature. So I, I do think what we're going to find is um, the, uh, you know, these folks have, have their, their reward system has been damaged or at least temporarily downregulated so that they're, they're just not as sensitive to normal rewards of human life, the things that you do and are able to sort of stay interested in the world doing and, you know, sports and, and uh, your family and, and the kinds of things that really keep people engaged in the world. For these folks that have had their reward system, you know, turned down, th those things don't register. And I think what may be happening is these contingencies, these incentives sort of break through some of that sludge in their brain and they're able to experience reward and, and they talk about it giving them something to hold on to so it's a it's an important I think uh, uh, mechanism for helping them stop their stimulant use I think that may be the last slide uh, and there's my both of those emails are uh, are good ones you can either the University of Vermont one or the UCLA one uh, still work so uh, I and I would keep 10 minutes for questions, and I think I've got 11 minutes. So um, feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. I think you have at least 11 questions. They've been coming flying in while you while you were talking. And let me start at the top. By the way, I apologize for talking so fast, but I, on webinars, I sort of get a, a bird's eye view of the topic, and I wanted to cover what I thought were the most salient issues. And so all of these things, you know, the, the training and all of these um, effective treatments, talk to your ATTCs about those and get some technical assistance. Thanks, Rick. We appreciate just, that. Just trying to drum up some business for you. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, first question that came in on cocaine-related deaths between 2003 and 2017. What is, what is the cause of the increase of deaths in 2006? Oh, um, let's see. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would have to go back. Uh, I, I don't really remember, um, since I was mostly interested in this most recent uh, upswing of deaths, but uh, I, I honestly don't know what the, what, if there was a blip on 2006, I'm not sure. Oops. Um, yep, you're right. There is a blip. I, I suspect it was just that we had, we did have a period, you know, as, as many of you may remember, I mean, the cocaine epidemic was late 80s through the mid 90s. Then it pretty much leveled off and went down and methamphetamine took over in many parts of the country. The uh, restrictions on Sudafed put a, a damper on methamphetamine manufacturing in the uh, in uh, some of that time, but uh, let's see if the, what the methamphetamine numbers look like. Yeah, see, the methamphetamine numbers have always stayed pretty low. I think that may have been the lowering availability of methamphetamine caused more cocaine to be used and that that was associated with an increased uh, death rate. That's my guess, but it's a pure guess. Thank you. I'm going to condense a few of the questions. We've had multiple questions regarding funding for contingency management. Do you have any anything to suggest or recommend? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's um, organization by organization. Right now, it, I mean, I talked to one of the local clinics here is a federally qualified health center um, in the town I live in. They said as, as part of their FQHC funding, they receive various kinds of grants that they can get because they're FQHCs. And uh, they've been able to get some money uh, through that mechanism to set up a contingency management uh, program. Uh, in some of the clinics that are hospital-affiliated clinics, uh, they've been able to go to the hospital, uh, explain the value of treating stimulant use disorder, show them the data, and get uh, some funding. Some of the California clinics have actually been able to use the uh, opioid money, the STR and SOR money that's been given to states to address the opioid epidemic insofar as they're able to use, to, to treat patients on buprenorphine and methadone who are using cocaine. Uh, so they're, they're using it for treating patients with opioid use disorders as they have to. That money is, is dedicated for opioids but they're, they're treating their co-occurring stimulant use disorder. Um, I worked with a program in Los Angeles that went out to the community and actually got donations from uh, stores and movie theaters and uh, fast food places and, and uh, were able to uh, come up with a small contingency program. This doesn't have, I mean, the, if you look at the literature and you look at the NIDA uh, manuals and Nancy Petrie's work that's great. Sometimes it can seem awfully complicated and awfully uh, onerous to try to set all this up. It's really not. It's, it can be done very easily. Come in and give a, a drug-free urine on Friday and you can earn a $10 uh, coupon or a voucher or something uh, for this. It is the big challenge is how to find the money. I, I grant you that. I just think that um, I've seen a lot of people develop creative ways of doing it. And until we get the government to be able to directly fund it as they fund medicine and counseling, uh, these, these creative efforts are going to have to uh, be uh, uh, the way we do it. Thanks, Rick. Next question. Is there the possibility of a medication-assisted treatment model for MAMP use similar to methadone suboxone treatment? No. There's, I mean, we're looking, and the medications that I uh, listed, the promising medications, are, are exactly that. They're promising, and they, they may be something that will give us that tool for treating people with uh, methamphetamine disorders. But right now, there's nothing, and I mean, I ran a bunch of these trials, uh, and I've also run a lot of trials with methadone and buprenorphine. 
it's day and night. I mean, the 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 effect of giving an opioid uh, addicted individual a dose of methadone or buprenorphine is profound. They feel better. They get a strong response from the medicine. Uh, none of these medications that we're, we've looked at for stimulant use disorders have that kind of impact. Some of them seem to help some with some of the depression and some of the anhedonia, but there's nothing yet that really cuts through like our opioid medications. Okay, great. What do you think of people being cut off from medication assisted treatment because they continue to use meth? By the way, that's an excellent question. I'm glad somebody asked that question. You know, 10 years ago or five, even five years ago, I would have been, well, you know, you, you really ought to try to work with them and you really should try not to kick them off from medication. You really ought to try to, you know, work with. In the area of fentanyl, kicking people off medication is for many of the patients a death sentence. Uh, kicking, I think, I think you're going to see more and more the AMA and, and ASAM and others start to change kind of the, not just a recommendation, but actually the ethics of treatment are going to be you can't kick people off uh, for use of uh, a disorder because it, it would be like taking away their insulin because they're eating cupcakes. Um, it's, uh, it really is it, in, the, in an era of fentanyl. And for those of you who grew up where fentanyl was on, you know, part of the deal, when, when we used to see fentanyl in our opioid clinics, it was an emergency. It was like, it was like something that never happened. Uh, occasionally a pharmacy would be burglarized and people would use, get, a, get a, a, some fentanyl patches and be using them. The way it is now, I mean, you have states like New Hampshire uh, next door to me who has uh, overdose death rates being driven by the fentanyl epidemic in West Virginia and Ohio that, were, that are really mind-bogglingly high, and it's an incredibly dangerous drug. So I really don't, unless some, a patient is violent or is uh, threatening the staff or something and is just not safe to keep in treatment, taking away their medicine for their opioid use disorder because they also have the disorder of stimulant dependence or cannabis dependence um, is really, in my mind, uh, unethical. And I think it's really, um, it, you're going to start to see that become much more robust recommendation. And thanks for whoever asked that question. Thank you, Rick. Next question. What are common examples of effective reinforcement or incentives? It can be difficult to think of an incentive that would be comparable in the mind of someone with a stimulant use disorder. Ah, yeah, that's a good option. You're right. No, no, you see, the thing that's interesting is that the, the thing you're giving as a reward is not competing with the euphoria of cocaine or methamphetamine. It seems to be to the patient, this gives them something to kind of concrete that they can earn and that they can accomplish and they can succeed at. And they... And the value of the reward and the contingency is far more than simply the $10 gift card you're giving them or the, you know, movie coupon. Because the contingencies are always delivered with social reinforcement, the staff saying, great job. Sometimes contingencies are delivered in group settings so that the other group members can say, good job, you know, that's great. And um, a lot of people can be very creative at how they do this. And it's, it's, it, I'm glad somebody asked that question because it's not as though you're trying to take a $10 thing and put it up against the disease of cocaine dependence or methamphetamine dependence. It's, it's a way for people to get one day at a time or two days at a time or, you know, the, it gives them a specific objective and a specific acknowledgement that they succeeded. And a lot of these folks have been so unsuccessful at their efforts to stop using, that they just kind of had given up trying, uh, even if they did want to stop. And so this is, it sort of gives them it in an in a accomplishable way that they, and oftentimes people will set up that if you give, you know, urine on Friday that is a drug free, you can earn a $10 coupon. If you uh, can give four in a row or 
two in a row or something, you get a bonus of $25 coupon. And so you I mean the whole the, the strict contingency management a la Nancy Petrie system, I mean you have increasing rewards, you have bonuses for longer stay. There's a, there's a bunch of wrinkles to it, but the basic concept is very simple, is find some way of, of giving the patient a specific, doable, achievable challenge having to do with reducing their drug use and then build on it. Great. I see it's uh, top of the hour. Rick, do you have time for one more question? We've, we've sure. received many. All right. And people uh, can, can you... email me the questions. I, I do a lot of uh, email, uh, you know, uh, communication with people. So I'd, I'd be happy if there's things that people uh, didn't get answered. Uh, you saw if you put up my uh, the last slide that has my emails on it, people can uh, feel free to send me emails. Thanks, yeah, Rick. That's, really, that's a great offer. So we'll just wrap up with one question. What's the recommended length of inpatient treatment for clients who are injectors, daily, or high-use users? Yeah, good. Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, I'm not a physician, and I, I you know, I think the, the ACM criteria are probably um, the only thing we have to provide some measure of, of that. I don't know that there's any evidence to guide that. Um, that decision. I, I think that some people certainly need treatment in the weeks, if not months. Uh, others, I mean, for the injectors and the daily users and the longtime chronic users, and I mean, you're looking in that range. For the people who have been, you know, sort of less severe users, sometimes they come in and they're psychotic and they may need you know, uh, seven days, ten days to sort of get their brain underneath them. And uh, uh, but the trick is that continues to be underestimated and under um, focused on is if you're going to use a residential setting, a lot of the content during the residential treatment is about why and how they're going to stay in treatment once they transition to outpatient treatment because. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so they need to uh, be programmed with some positive stuff about staying in treatment once they discharge from whatever the length of stay is that they're in residential care. Thanks so much, Rick. I really appreciate your presentation and uh, responding to the many questions that we received over the course of the webinar. Just want to remind Good. everyone who remains on, remains on the line that the uh, recording of this webinar will be available online within one to two weeks on the Great Lakes ATTC and the Northwest ATTC website. Also want to alert people to an article that's appearing in the ATTC Messenger, the monthly electronic newsletter for the network by Dr. Rawson. It's titled Reemergence of Cocaine and Methamphetamine in the 21st Century. There's a link to that on the screen right now. So with that, uh, we did get a lot of questions from people asking about certificates of completion, and we will be generating those along with uh, links to the various resource materials. So thanks again, everyone, for joining the call, and thanks, Dr. Rawson. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>